Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar discussing the physiotherapy role in the management of bronchiolitis. My name is Louis Skemington Fossils, and I'm a paediatric physiotherapist working at King's College Hospital in London. I'm really thankful to be joined um, during this session by Ellie Malcoon, who's also a paediatric physiotherapist working at the Evelina Children's Hospital. Before we begin, we'd both like to extend our thanks to the uh, South Thames Paediatric Network for asking us to deliver this webinar providing the link to the teaching on their website and social media platforms. So the reason for this teaching um, is because our colleagues in the Southern Hemisphere have reported a twofold surge increase in RSV admissions in comparison to historic averages uh, in their summer. Public Health England have modelled a possible sharp rise in admissions uh, with an extended viral season from August through to March 2022 a significant increase uh, being placed upon both paediatric ward and critical care beds. Preparations are already underway to prepare local hospitals as well as the larger tertiary centres to manage this increased demand for paediatric beds. However, we are aware that not all hospitals with paediatric wards have allocated specialist paediatric physiotherapy services. And therefore, this teaching has been put together as a resource to help provide a background to the physiotherapy management in bronchiolitis at both the ward and critical care level. This resource is, no, is only an introduction to the physiotherapy management of bronchiolitis, during which we will share our clinical experience as well as, well as drawing upon the uh, clinical guidelines and available research. Uh, during this session, I will aim to cover a basic understanding of what bronchiolitis is. Uh, I'll review the pathophysiology physiology of bronchiolitis and we'll discuss some of the common chest X-ray and lung ultrasound findings. Um, I'll then proceed on to talk about the current guidance and, and research for the child with bronchiolitis on the ward with no comorbidities. I'm now going to hand over to Ellie, who will kind of, uh, kind of run us through what she's going to cover in this webinar. So I'll be looking at those children that do have comorbidities and potentially will be more responsive to physiotherapy input, understanding why those comorbidities have that impact on their respiratory function. We will look at those patients that then present to the intensive care unit and see the variety of ways in which they do present and what problems they may have. I'll take you through the variety of options that are available to physiotherapists working on the PICU, some of the evidence based behind it, and look at the clinical reasoning for when these treatments may or may not be appropriate for this patient cohort. And finally, we're going to look at some of the data we collected at Evelyn and London Children's Hospital a couple of years back, identifying what happened to these children when they received physiotherapy and what outcomes they had. So bronchiolitis is in its most simple form, and as its name suggests, is characterised by inflammation of the bronchioles, often caused by a viral infection. Bronchiolitis is the most common lower respiratory tract infection in children under the age of two, and typically the main cause is the respiratory symptom virus. But other pathogens may include rhinovirus, adenovirus, human metanumavirus, and a parainfluenza virus. Bronchiolitis is typically self-limiting, with the peak severity occurring around two to three days, but a cough which may continue for a few weeks beyond this. The typical history reported by the parent or carer of the child is an initial period of the child being chorizal for anywhere between one to three days, which can then progress onto the child developing symptoms which may include a persistent cough, fever or poor feeding. The clinical presentation of bronchiolitis includes rhinitis, cough, tachypnea, use of accessory respiratory muscles, hypoxia and variable wheezing and crackles on auscultation. Some risk factors which may predispose children to be at a greater risk of severe illness are those born prematurely with chronic lung disease, infants under three months of age, those with congenital heart disease or immunodeficiency. So I'm now just going to play a short video from Stacey, one of our South 10 paediatric clinical lead nurses who has kindly put together a short in, uh, informative video on the pathophysiology of bronchiolitis. So let's do a run through of the pathophysiology behind bronchiolitis. So as with a common cold, this starts with the entry of a pathogen into the upper respiratory tract. So as we know, RSV is responsible for a large part of the bronchiolitis that we deal with every winter. But it can also be caused by adenovirus, rhinovirus, 
many other viruses, including coronavirus. So what happens once it enters the respiratory tract, you're going to get some local inflammation. You're going to get um, the goblet cells increasing production of mucus and start to get those cold symptoms, that congestion, the snotty nose. The replication then starts to move down those airways and the support mechanisms to prevent that happening is within your epithelium and your cilia, which are actually trying to brush the virus, trying to fight it and brush it up towards the nose and out again and prevent it from tracking down. But we can't always prevent it. Sometimes that will track down and that will also depend on how good the, the um, immune response is for the baby. So clinical findings at this stage are really looking at uh, cold type symptoms. Um, so sort of chorizal with or without a cough, um, perhaps feeling a bit of a sore throat. You might get some mild tachypnea and dyspnea um, and certainly some reduction in feeding, although it, they may also try to increase feeding to increase their um, fluid intake. Uh, so you may see some nasal flaring if it's particularly if it's an underweight um, baby or a sort of ex premature baby. But at this point in time, they're either going to start to get better over one to three days or things are going to progress down the respiratory tract, the lower respiratory tract. So at this point, once it moves down the respiratory tract, the lower airways, you get an inflammatory response, a local inflammatory response. And if we look at this cross-sectional part of the airway, then you can see the one of the first things that happens is the submucosal edema. So that inflammatory response, we know we get leaky vessels and lots of inflammatory um, cascade that happens that results in that edema. And this also happens locally in the airways. You also get that increased production of mucus from the goblet cells. So already you can see a narrowing of this airway. Now for babies that already have a narrow airway in comparison to adults, this causes a lot of resistance in the airways. So on top of that, we also have some necrosis starting to happen on your epithelium. So some of these epithelial cells will necrose and start to slough off. As they slough off, they start to sort of form together with the mucus and start to cause more resistance in the airway. And you can see the difference that's been made there by the mucosal edema, the mucus and the epithelial sloughing off. And that has caused a lot of resistance in that airway. So as we look at this trajectory of air down through the airway, you can see that narrowing from a sideways view and how much resistance that could cause for the movement of air within that airway. Now, remember the airway resistance that we're going to meet there is going to make some kind of musical noises. And that's why we hear that wheeze in bronchiolitis that makes us reach for the nebulizers and want desperately to treat it as we would asthma. But this is why it's not going to work because it's a different source of the problem. The wheeze isn't, isn't, um, hasn't come about in the exact same way as it does within asthma. So let's have a look, little bit of a look down the sort of bronchial tree as to what that would look down here, like down here. And we can see that thickening down the small bronchi and the bronchioles, and then that increased mucus production. And you can see that we've got that thinning of the airways and then that epithelial cells, necrotic, sloughing off and starting to form with the mucus to create a kind of mucus plug. So at this point, we're looking at some aero narrowing, which we've very clearly seen now on all three of those images. So the narrowing becomes worse and we start to get a lot of resistance down the airway. So the, the air is going to travel down the path of least resistance. But if it does try to get down these bronchi bronchioles, then we're going to down into the alveoli here that are past the plugging, then what we're going to get is... Um, some airflow coming through at first because it's like a one-way valve but unfortunately what you get is that it's it can't actually get out so what happens is the air starts coming through into the alveoli no way of escape through that one-way valve and you start to get that airway trapping 
and that's why we get airway trapping within bronchiolitis. So as that alveolus starts to expand, you get to the point where it's completely plugged off and there is nowhere to escape. That air will eventually be reabsorbed and once the air can't enter the alveoli anymore, it will collapse down and that's where we're going to get some atelectasis. So this is why you get airway, um, airway trapping and atelectasis in bronchiolitis. And then you can see that the, that the air will then follow that path of least resistance and um, we'll, you'll have more pressure going to the healthy alveoli, which may form more air trapping. So the symptoms that we're going to see at this point is obviously that in, as the trajectory of the illness goes on, if you've not seen it already, then definitely some nasal flaring, increasing that cough, increasing tachypnea, increasing dyspnea. We're going to start to see use of accessory muscles such as the sternocleidomastoid, which is going to cause that head bopping that we see in children and in, in particularly in babies. You're going to see intercostal muscle use and subcostal recession. You're going to start to see some sort of abdominal movements where the abdo abdomen is being used to support the respiratory status. And then we're going to start to perhaps see some seesaw breathing with that. You're also going to see subcostal intercostal recession and you may also see some tracheal tug later on and perhaps hear some grunting if this does advance to a serious illness. Obviously, increased temperature with the virus. We're going to see increased heart rate going to start to see a drop in sats once we have that mismatch in perfusion and ventilation and because of the reduced um, feeding and fluid and the work of breathing that's going in to supply oxygen to the body we're going to see lethargy dehydration decrease urine output at some point also for the infants we may see a drop in respiratory rate at this point and we need to be very aware of the risk of apneas particularly in those small babies Okay, thank you Stacey for that. So essentially in summary what we've got is an acute infection of the epithelial cells which result in this inflammatory response with increased kind of submucosal edema. We've also got increased mucus production and some cellular necrosis of the epithelial cells going on. This ultimately also results in some areas of atelectasis uh, and gas trapping. Um, and what we'll do is we're going to come on uh, to discuss whether in the previous now, although bronchiolitis is a well-recognized clinical presentation based primarily on the history of the illness and physical examination findings, additional tests such as viral isolation, blood serology and chest x-rays are often ordered, although they have very little impact on diagnosis and do not alter the clinical course. Although current guidance advises against the routine use of chest x-rays in suspected bronchiolitis cases, recent data suggests it is still performed in around 50% of cases. Typical findings of chest x-rays and bronchiolitis are often non-specific, with findings of patrial segmental atelectasis, hyperinflation, bronchial thickening in the perihylar regions and perihylar enlargement. Often the reason for the use of chest x-rays in bronchiolitis is to rule out the presence of pneumonia. However, research has shown that the use of chest x-rays in bronchiolitis has been associated with increased prescription of unrequired antibiotics, increased healthcare costs, increased exposure to ionizing radiation and increased emergency department waiting times. NICE guidance, however, does advise consider performing a chest x-ray if intensive care is being proposed for a child. Now, as there's a growing number of respiratory physiotherapists utilizing point of care ultrasound, I thought we uh, briefly discussing within this session. Currently, lung ultrasound is not considered in the diagnostic algorithm for bronchiolitis, although its usefulness has been demonstrated over recent years as an emerging diagnostic tool. Some of its benefits of use over chest x-ray include the absence of ionizing radiation, its sensitivity for identifying small consolidations, signs of interstitial infiltrates and pleural effusions. Recent studies are exploring its use to determine the clinical progression of bronchiolitis, predict the need for increased respiratory support, to help diagnose or rule out pneumonia in cases of suspected bronchiolitis. Typical findings when using point of care lung ultrasound in bronchiolitis include small to medium hypoechoic consolidations with or without the presence of air bronchograms. These tend to be most prevalent within the inferior and posterior paravertebral areas. Alveolar interstitial syndrome with the presence of felines and pleural line irregularities. And the video clips that you can see on the slide are taken from two patients recently admitted to our paediatric intensive care unit 
uh, with bronchiolitis caused by RSV and human metanumavirus. Okay, so if we come on to have a look at the current guidance for chest physiotherapy and bronchiolitis, um, and you take a look at the 2015 NICE guidance uh, for bronchiolitis, it states that chest physiotherapy should not be completed in infants aged less than 24 months old with acute bronchiolitis without relevant comorbidities. And relevant comorbidities may include children with neuromuscular weakness, um, those with separative lung disease, tracheomalacia, or long-term ventilation needs, for example. For children with comorbidities, then the guidelines advise requesting a physiotherapy assessment, uh, for further advice or intervention, and that's really important to remember and something Ellie's going to talk us through shortly. The guidance for the normally fit and well child is based upon a number of studies completed over the years for which the data has been collated and published in the Cochrane Review, which was last updated in 2015. The aim of the review was to determine the efficacy of chest physiotherapy in infants aged less than 24 months old with acute bronchiolitis. And the secondary objective was to determine the efficacy of different techniques of chest physiotherapy and bronchiolitis. Uh, the review included 12 RCTs with over 1,200 participants and reported that none of the techniques were viewed, uh, which included kind of forced expiratory techniques, uh, percussion, um, expiratory vibrations were found to have any beneficial effect upon the severity of the disease. The review also found kind of high quality evidence that forced respiratory techniques uh, were related to an increased risk of transient respiratory destabilization. And when we consider the pathophysiology of bronchiolitis, these findings are perhaps unsurprising. Uh, we've got a disease process which is largely inflammatory um, and in the fit and well child where the cough reflex is preserved, um, kind of would hope and expect that they can manage kind of the lower respiratory tract uh, secretions. Uh, independently and without physiotherapy intervention. Now, if we come on to look at what we know works in bronchiolitis, the management is predominantly supportive and the key principles are on the slide for you to see. I don't want to go into these in too much detail as they are covered in the other webinars available under the STPN network. But let's just give a brief overview. We need to consider ensuring adequate hydration. Infants and young children with bronchiolitis can have increased insensible losses from fever and tachypnea, as well as decreased intake due to congestion, tachypnea and respiratory distress. If all fluids cannot be maintained, then IV or NG fluids may be prescribed. Your medical and nursing team may also consider supplemental feeding in discussion with your dietitians, if needed, and tailoring the amount and frequency of nutrition that is given to avoid bloating and impacting negatively upon the child's work of breathing. Provision of oxygen therapy when required is essential, and this may be through low flow, high flow, or CPAP. This again is covered in great detail in another of the webinars within this series, so for more information on initiating and escalating oxygen therapy, I'll direct you towards that session. Suctioning of the upper airway where indicated and optimising positioning are vital and I'll come on to discuss these in more detail. And finally, comfort measures, which are really important as we want to avoid causing further distress or upset to the child. A stressed and upset child is at greater risk of producing more secretions, as well as having increased airway irritability and edema. Comfort measures may include ensuring cares are clustered, making sure the child is kept appropriately warm and comfortable, Minimising handling where possible, ensure they are receiving enough nutrition, either orally or via NG feeding, and controlling environmental factors such as lowering lighting and reducing noise levels. So, as we know, babies are ob obligatory nose breathers until the age of around four to six months. The nasal passages are also very small, which means that consequently their work of breathing can quickly and significantly increase if their nasal passages become occluded. The advice from NICE is that we shouldn't routinely be performing suction on these children. However, that if there is clear respiratory distress or feeding difficulties because of upper airway secretions, then to go ahead and clear this with suctioning. Another even more concerning indication for suction is if the child is presenting with apneas and this is to stimulate the respiratory drive. Those of you who may not be familiar with suctioning infants, I'll direct, direct you towards the ACPC guideline, guidelines which should provide you with all the information you need to carry out the process safely and effectively. I will just mention that the guidance does say that deep suctioning with a nasopharyngeal catheter may not be beneficial and can have adverse effects. Now if we come on to look at positioning, 
as I've already mentioned, we should be trying to minimise handling and intervention where possible to ensure we are not adding the stress levels of our patients. However, that being said, it's important to ensure their position is optimised as best as possible. Children of a de developmental maturity that will allow them to reposition themselves independently will often find themselves the position that they find most comfortable and advantageous for their respiratory system. However, for those infants that have not yet developed the gross motor skills to manage this, they may need some support in achieving this. Often helping to facilitate a supine position with the head slightly elevated is a good starting point, but it's important to consider the anatomical and physiological differences in young children which will impact upon your decision making process. The common occiput of an infant means that the neck has a tendency to come into a flexed position and when the child is supine, it can potentially cause airway obstruction. By placing a towel under the child's shoulders, you can help maintain a neutral head position with the airway optimally positioned. Also, the more soft and cartilaginous ribcage of the infant and young child means that they will preferentially ventilate the non-dependent lung. So if considering positioning inside line for possible drainage, this is something important to remember, as well as the natural ventilation perfusion mismatch that occurs in children. There are some studies that indicate a positive effect of prone positioning for children with respiratory problems, but these have predominantly been carried out in the premature infants who are mechanically ventilated. Because of the risk of sudden death, sudden infant death syndrome, infants and children with bronchiolitis who are placed in a prone position should have continuous pulse oximetry monitoring, and the reason for positioning the child in that way should be explained to the parent. My clinical experience, this is something that is rarely done in the ward-based child, but worth mentioning as there is some evidence base for this. So in regards to nebulizer therapy, none of the drugs listed here are actually recommended in the guidelines for bronchiolitis. There has been a number of studies looking at bronchodilator use and a few with conflicting findings, but the general consensus is that they do not change the course of the patient's illness. Nebulized DNAs has also been tested in hospitalized infants with acute bronchiolitis with the aim of enhancing airway clearance and reducing airway obstruction. However, no significant effect was observed on clinical severity or length of stay. If we just come on to look at hypertonic saline in a bit more detail. Uh, as I mentioned on the previous slide, it is not something recommended within the guidance and in my clinical experience, not something used in children with bronchiolitis without comorbidities outside of the PICU setting. There was a Cochrane review uh, published in 2017 that included studies trialing hypertonic saline against either 0.9% saline or no nebulizer therapy for children with acute bronchiolitis. There are some promising findings for improving the severity of respiratory distress, extending sleeping time and shortening the trial's length of stay. Proposed mechanisms of benefit are inducing an osmotic flow of water in the mucus layer, thereby rehydrating the airway surface and improving mucus clearance, helping to break ionic bonds within the mucus gel and lowering the viscosity and elasticity of the mucus, stimulating cilia beat frequency, and theoretically, there is a suggestion that by absorbing water from the mucosa and submucosa, hypertonic saline solutions can reduce edema of the airway wall in infants with bronchiolitis. But as I said, this is not something we use on the ward-based child uh, without comorbidities here at King's, and it's something um, that if you're considering, it's important to be aware of the risk associated, such as inducing bronchospasm. As the NICE guidance suggests, physiotherapy may well be more relevant for those patients who have bronchiolitis alongside other comorbidities. Let's have a little look at that and discuss why that may be so. When we look at our patients that have spinal muscular atrophy or other neuromuscular weaknesses, we have a number of elements towards their comorbid disease that can affect the secretion clearance. Sometimes they have poor inspiratory strength in order to get those adequate volumes to have a good cough. Sometimes they have poor glottic control, which can increase levels of aspiration, increasing secretions and sometimes means that they cannot close their glottis adequately time to produce a good, strong cough. And they also aren't able to recruit their accessory muscles, and this decreases the amount of expiratory flow they can provide when they cough. All of these can be amplified by physiotherapy techniques, which will enable them to clear any additional secretions they have with their bronchiolitis. 
One thing with our neuromuscular patients to be aware of is that sometimes they are so weak they can be struggling for breath but do not show the stereotypical signs of work of breathing. So just monitor these patients closely, but don't be fooled that just because they're not working hard doesn't mean that they aren't struggling. NIV, by level NIV, should be our first line of treatment for children that have low saturations with neuromuscular weakness. And this is shown in the BTS guidelines. So it is really important for our weak patients that we don't just put oxygen on or CPAP on and assume that's doing the job because they can very silently increase their carbon dioxide levels and cause their respiratory function to be undertreated. Our patients with neurodisability, however, are a different cohort. They may well have weakness, they may well have less spontaneous movement, all of which may impact their ability to clear their secretions. But for the most part, when you trigger a cough, this is strong and this is effective. So physiotherapy may be important in evaluating their chest status and advising and promoting regular position changes and cuddles with parents, but they may not need any particular manual techniques in order to enhance them. in Malaysia may have a baseline increased secretion level anyway, and this will increase further as they suffer with their bronchiolitis. They also may be at risk of bronchiectasis if bronchial malacia is severe and collapses their downstream lung while they're breathing. The one thing you have to be very aware of with patients with tracheomalacia is as they work harder with their breathing, pulling further down on their diaphragm, they increase very large negative pressures and this further cuts with their airways. This increases their work of breathing and their secretion retention in a very cyclical fashion. Keeping these patients calm and settled is paramount. And sometimes providing PEEP can splint open their airways. And anecdotally, I would say that percussion can be effective in calming down these patients and enabling them to just move some of those secretions to their more central airways. I would, however, hugely avoid anything that involves negative pressure, such as cough assist machine, because that will just further promote your collapsing of airways and actually further impede their secretion clearance. Some cardiac conditions do cause bronchial restrictions or increased tracheomalacia. You also get increased risk of shunting blood between oxygenated and deoxygenation side of circulations, and they are more likely to get fatigue. However, their secretion production won't necessarily be increased above a baseline from any other child. What we need to do is assess these patients closely, as they are going to be at higher risk of deterioration you may find the risk versus benefit of treatment may slightly weigh in favour of benefit, especially if you're worried about them becoming fatigued due to secretion retention, but this really needs to be thoroughly analysed on a patient by patient basis. Separative lung disease, such as cystic fibrosis or PCD, doesn't actually show that you've got an increased risk of a PICU stage due to bronchiolitis. Sometimes an admission to HDU or PICU is what triggers the further investigation that enables us to find the diagnosis for this patient cohort. If the patient is already diagnosed, they very probably have an established physio program of positioning or exercise or PEP or percussion. And the idea is that you just need to do what you normally do, potentially with a slightly increased time of doing it, duration or frequency. But if what they have as a baseline works, just do it, potentially slightly more. Patients with chronic lung disease don't actually usually have an increase in secretions as a baseline. If they get bronchiolitis, they're much more likely to have an inflammatory response to it, being wheezy. If the patient isn't well enough, they're headed towards critical care and a chest x-ray has been done. And there are changes that show focal consolidation or pneumonia, then physio may have a role to play. However, if their cough remains strong, there is no evidence that we provide any additional benefit. For our patients on long term ventilation, 
whether physio will make a difference or not when they've got bronchiolitis will be hugely dependent on their baseline conditions. So I very much refer you to the conditions we've already talked about and the role physiotherapy has in them. What you might want to do is assess and decide with the MDT about alterations to ventilator settings. And if there are any baseline physio programmes, you may want to increase the frequency or duration of these. Another tool that is worth having in your back pocket for patients on long term ventilation, especially those that already have percussion programs, you may want to increase their ventilator pressures when doing this, as it may enable you to recruit more lung areas and provide forward flow of sputum towards the central airway. Not all patients with bronchiolitis that present on ITU are the same. Therefore, we cannot treat them as if they are all the same, and there isn't a blanket prescription of what physiotherapy should do. Some of them are inflamed, some of them are wheezy, some of them are gas trappy, some of them are phlegmy, they're my favourite ones, some of them are consolidated, and some of them present more like an ARDS picture. So what do we do when we've got such a heterogeneous population? Well, when you get to a patient, you need to assess them. You need to do your full respiratory assessment like you would for any other patient. You then need to look at your problem list. Are they physio problems? A child being in type 1 or type 2 respiratory failure isn't necessarily a physio problem. We need to have a look and see, can we improve our VQ matching? Is there a secretion issue? Is there a work of breathing that we could improve? Is there any alterations to ventilation that might improve how they are breathing? But not every problem a child with bronchiolitis will have on PICU will be a physio problem. And if there is no physio problem, there is no indication to treat. Physiotherapy in this population can make these patients worse rather than better. So I would heavily emphasise that this is not a population you treat just in case or to prove that you have done physiotherapy just to make sure. If there is not a physiotherapy problem indicated by assessment, then physiotherapy is not appropriate. However, our patients on PICU are often sedated and there will be a cohort of them that may require muscle relaxant. And this is where physio can be most effective because patients that are sedated and or muscle relaxed often have a weaker cough and physio can be very effective in enabling that cohort to clear their secretion. So physiotherapy treatment on PICU. There isn't any correct and in inverted commas physio for intensive care. Treatments even within UK centres and throughout the world have very wide variation that is dependent on local policies, procedures and experience. And when you look into the evidence, it's very minimal for what we do on paediatric intensive care. Any department is most likely to be successful using those techniques the practitioners feel most confident in and have most experience with. And what I would emphasise is if this is a patient population you are not used to treating and you have any concerns or questions, find a specialist centre or a specialist practitioner and ask. You may get different answers from the people that you ask, but that's where it comes back to the fact that there isn't necessarily a correct way. And what we need to do is assess our patients, find out what their specific problems are and clinically reason as to what the best intervention will be.
for any physiotherapists listening that are not paediatric by background, I'm very quickly going to go through some of the differences we have in our paediatric population that might require you to alter some of the techniques you use with your adult patients. Number one, young infants do not have collateral ventilation in the same way as adults do. Therefore, some of your manoeuvres that you might use, such as manual hyperinflation or ventilator hyperinflation to recruit using collateral ventilation will not be effective in the same way. Our patients are also very, very quick to recruit. They have very, very compliant lungs that unfortunately deflate very quickly. And therefore, when you are using any techniques, you want to maintain that peak that you have as much as possible. The advantage with children is they have a hugely compliant rib cage. So all your manual techniques work way better on children. But a disadvantage is they have very large abdominal organs and any child lying on their back will find that their stomach, their liver and their spleen ride up into their chest cavity, reducing their FRC and lowering their lung volumes. So I would always advise nursing slightly side to side and prone is hugely effective for this population. Our patients are very quick to fatigue. It is much more advantageous to do multiple shorter sessions rather than long sessions of handling because you can cause instability from both the respiratory and cardiovascular perspective with large amounts of handling. They have huge vagal stimulation if you suction them to the level of carina and you can cause dramatic changes in your heart rate, your blood pressure and your saturations. So I will talk about suctioning later, but suctioning to a measured length is hugely essential with this population. They have a larger surface area ratio and that can take hold very quickly. It's common in paediatrics to treat children either with heaters on or so that they are still covered up with blankets. They use their upper lobes to ventilate most. So if they have a collapsed upper lobe, that will all exponentially affect their respiratory gas exchange more and they do deteriorate very quickly if they're unhappy but they turn around quickly too which makes them an utter delight to treat. Positioning and changing of position is one of the most commonly used interventions with physiotherapy however this can be provided holistically from all members of the MDT. As Louis has already said, you need to be very careful of the VQ mismatch and the fact that sometimes lying a patient in a specific position to encourage drainage may increase their oxygen requirement. And some of the evidence behind positioning actually isn't there as much as we think. But positioning can be very useful when used alongside other manual techniques to help shift secretions into a central airway. Louis has already talked about nebulizers and saline and how that is used. We're not going to cover that here. But there is evidence with regards to the use of saline with suction, and it's shown that really it shouldn't be used routinely. If you do have thick secretions, what saline can do is provide a venturi effect enable the loose saline to pull the thick secretions up into the suction catheter. So on certain individually assessed occasions, putting some saline down with suction can be useful. And then instilling larger amounts of saline into the ET tube alongside either manual hyperinflation or ventilator hyperinflation works for a very different reason than saline and suction does. We have to remember mucus is lipid by nature. Saline does not make it looser. Saline does not change the consistency of sputum. But when you put larger amounts down an ETT, what it can do is provide a mechanical force to flush secretions off the edge of the bronchial openings. Manual hyperinflation is again something that is very commonly used within a paediatric intensive care setting and it is performed in a variety of ways but generally you give a big breath that may well be held on an inspiration 
followed by a rapid release. You do want to maintain PEEP even when releasing the bag because of the levels of derecruitment that children can suffer from. There is some evidence behind manual hyperinflation and certainly Shannon and her team in 2015 talked about how different techniques on the bag can increase your peak expiratory flow by increasing your peak inspiratory pressures. So it is one of the interventions that is slightly more evidence based. There is an increasing move towards ventilator hyperinflation, and this has been used quite a lot within the adult COVID population for both infection control reasons and again to try and help maintain that peep within the airways. There are different ways of doing it by adjusting your tidal volumes if you're on a volume guaranteed mode or by adjusting your peak inspiratory pressures if you're on a pressure support mode to try and achieve a larger tidal volume than the patient is getting at baseline. There aren't any national guidelines at present and different trusts have individual protocols but there is some thought within the international literature it's advantageous because you can control your pressures better to avoid barotrauma and volutrauma. Both ventilator hyperinflation and manual hyperinflation can be used alongside a variety of manual techniques to help propel sputum towards central airways to be suctioned up. Louis, how much are you using manual hyperinflation versus ventilator hyperinflation in your patients that have bronchiolitis? Um, yeah, I think, as you mentioned there before earlier, it all comes down to the assessment. So I think in the lightly sedated child who's kind of uh, some of their respiratory muscle strength is preserved and they've got a good kind of um, independent cough strength, then actually in terms of trying to generate peak expiratory flows, I mean, whether we need MHR, VHI to do that, I think often the child can do that much better than we can. But when we're looking at that child who's uh, either more heavily sedated or muscle relaxed, or perhaps with a comorbidity, as you've touched on, yeah, then MHI is something we use really frequently in that cohort of patients with bronchiolitis. Um, VHI, not so much. It definitely was something that kind of came into discussion and to be nationally when um, the pandemic kind of hit. Um, looking at avoiding uh, unnecessary kind of disconnection from the ventilator where possible. But VHI here at King's isn't something we routine, routinely use, uh, both in bronchiolitis and in other kind of forms of pathology as well. Um, but yeah, MHI I'd say is a go-to, but only in those patients where actually um, you think you're going to be able to kind of extrapolate uh, peak expiratory flow bias, which is greater than the patient coughing themselves, I guess, or as a technique to help stimulate a cough in your patient. I think actually MHI is really good at stimulating coughs in some of those patients. And it's a way I didn't talk about earlier. It can be utilised. I think it can be hugely beneficial and agree that we don't use vent hyperinflation very much at Evelina, but for those patients that are on high peeps or are really not tolerating disconnecting from the vent, it does enable you to have another pool in your back pocket that can help us clear some of those secretions effectively. Percussion is one of the interventions that most of the MDT would describe as physiotherapy. And it is very commonly done by physiotherapists. There is no evidence whatsoever about what force to use or what speed to do it at. And most of the evidence is based in a CF population with very little there for the acute population. In some centres, it's used alongside nebulised saline, alongside manual hyperinflation or increasing ventilator pressures. So it isn't necessarily used as an intervention as in isolation. I would say anecdotally, it works very well with patients with malacia, but if you generally have a patient with high amounts of gas trapping, percussion alone, I've not found to be hugely beneficial in getting secretions into the central airways. Chest wall vibrations, so compressing the patient's chest rapidly 
on an expiratory flow aims to propel secretions into the larger airways. This is something that's been relatively well researched in the literature between Shannon and her team. And this is a sensor map Shannon used when she was looking at her research. The thing with VIBS is timing is essential. Whether you're doing it on a ventilator or whether you're doing it combined with a bag or manual hyperinflation, early vibrations can give high peak inspiratory pressures that can be dangerous. Late vibrations, whilst not harmful, aren't actually going to give you any increase in peak expiratory flow. So timing is essential in order to get that large breath in and that forward propulsion of secretions. But as Louis said earlier when we were discussing other matters, if you have a child that is awake and coughing, their cough, it is, if it is strong enough, will always be more beneficial in clearing secretions than anything a physiotherapist can provide externally. Saline lavage is a technique that is not universally used across PICUs. Essentially, you put a child in the reverse postural drainage position to try and target larger amounts of saline to go into that area. You then turn them around to do your true postural drainage, combine it with big breaths, bids, and then suction out what you get out. Um, I find that this is very effective, especially in patients you think may well have sputum plugs in main airways. So those that show chest x-ray changes without bronchograms in focal lobe collapse or consolidation. Um, but I'm very aware that we are much more generous with saline at Evelina than other centres are happy in doing. I mean, Louis, have you ever tried using this technique? What do you think about its use in patients with bronchiolitis? Uh, in bronchiolitis, to be honest, the amount of saline that will uh, I'll, I'll stay away from the virus maybe instill um, is, I know, kind of a lesser amount than you use at the Evelina. So we're looking at half a mil to a mil. In terms of saline lavage, Again, it's not something we routinely find ourselves needing to use. Um, it's again, it's a tool or a technique that is there. As you mentioned earlier, I think your indications for using it are spot on. Um, but no, it's not something we frequently use here. Um, again, particularly, I'm going to kind of always refer back to that child with no com comorbidities, but has made it into ITU. Um, it tends to be that actually, given the time for the disease process to kind of unfold, um, and as long as the sedation levels are managed appropriately, that actually those large secretions in the larger airway, the child can manage themselves. But it's there as a tool. And um, yeah, if you need it and it's indicated, then I can't see why not. So moving on to expiratory flow increase technique, this is actually one of the few intensive care interventions that seemingly has some evidence behind it. It seems like quite a complex manoeuvre. Uh, where you have a, one hand on the chest and one hand on the abdominal region and provide uh, pressures up to 40 times within quite a short amount of time, um, but does seemingly improve saturations within this one article. It's not something I've ever used. Have you, Louis? No, again, I can't um, say it's something in my kind of toolkit that I go to on a regular basis at all. Um, but might be worth looking up the paper if you're interested, team out there. Um, assisted autogenic drainage is a technique very much taken from the suppurative lung disease cohort. Um, again, can be done assisted, so externally by another person, can be done on patients that are ventilated. No interventional studies are are reported on the paediatric intensive care unit, but I know that we do have colleagues nationally that use it. My concern with this in patients that have a lot of gas trapping is that you're not going to have those pinch points in set quite the same way where differing flow levels will work in moving those secretions centrally. But I, I don't know what your opinion is, Louis. No, I agree. And I've spoken to some of our colleagues that either are aware of that are kind of using assisted AD um, within, yeah, both the ward and the PIC setting. Again, for the bronchiolitis cohort, not something that I commonly go to, um, but understand fully that there are different practices around kind of country.
Certainly, if the patient already has CF and uses AAD as part of their routine, I don't see why you would stop doing that because they were intubated. The two can go together, but yeah, it wouldn't be my go to. And then with the cough assist, there is evidence for using this in intubated and ventilated patients. Um, most of the evidence that has been created um, or investigated is in neuromuscular patients. Um, I think there is some adoption of using it with intubated or tracheostomized patients in the PICU, but for me, the key to this is picking appropriate patients. Uh, if a patient is already established on it or you have someone that has been muscle relaxed for a long time and isn't really clearing their secretions, um, might be appropriate. But we do know patients with bronchiolitis get a lot of derecruitment. And I think that adding negative pressure into that may well not be beneficial for them. We know that some of our patients are intubated and ventilated due to bronchiolitis have large issues with derecruitment on disconnection from the ventilator. Re-recruitment manoeuvres are something that has been investigated slightly by the literature, but it is difficult to analyse because, as you can see, the techniques, pressures, durations that are used vary greatly. Um, there's also no point in doing it if you're going to completely disconnect the bagging circuit in between putting the child back onto the ventilator because the lung pressures return to atmospheric and you don't retain that re-recruitment. So if you are going to use re-recruitment manoeuvres, then you do want to make sure you clamp your endotracheal tube when transferring onto the ventilator. Doing this is only safe if the patient is muscle relaxed. If a patient coughs against the clamp tube, you raise your interthoracic pressures hugely and increase your risk of pneumothorax. I would say this isn't something we do commonly at the Evelina, but can be useful for those that have high peeps, high pips, high FIO2s and are prone to do recruitment. But we very much uh, pick our population for doing it with. What about you guys, Louis? Uh, yes, same over here, Ellie. Uh, pick your population. Again, patients perhaps that are muscle relaxed, as you said, it might be beneficial. Um, and certainly we do use it in that cohort of patients. But again, it's not the go to and particularly obviously not with those patients who are only on light sedation would be indicated. So moving on to DNAs, I know that Louis has already covered that in his nebulizer section of the ward patients, but when your back is against a wall and you have a child that is moving nowhere with their ventilation and CO2s are through the roof, it is something that is sometimes used at Evelina where we instill it directly into the airways. Uh, we use physio techniques to wash it around the airways, leave it to dwell for half an hour and then clear it all out again. Um, the evidence isn't out there for doing it. Um, I think it probably works in 50% of the cases we do it with anecdotally. But if you feel like you've got nowhere to go and you have a very, very unwell child, again, it's about having those tools in your back pocket. If you have a pressure ventilated patient, I personally wouldn't nebulize using the ventilator just because you have a disease that is gas trapping in nature where you have a constant expiratory flow from the lungs and DNAs has a really poor dispersal coefficient so I've never found it to be particularly effective nebulizing it in patients with bronchiolitis just because of the pathophysiology of the bronchiolitis itself. Um, I don't know whether Louis ever used it at King's but as I said it's very much those patients that are very sick that we sometimes try it on at Evelina. Um, early mobility, there is a huge drive towards early mobility within the PICU population. Um, multiple studies nationally and internationally, although none of them have shown any particular changes in duration of ventilation or length of stay or um, physiological outcome measures. Uh, the trials are underway but what I will say is reducing patient sedation and 
uh, encouraging parental cuddles, moving them, even with an ETT in situ has been proven to be safe and not have increased adverse effects. And I think the more non-pharmacological measures we can use in this patient cohort to keep them comfortable, reduce sedation, encourage natural movement and encourage their natural cough reflexes will only be to their benefit. Suctioning, we have briefly touched upon with regards to nasal pharyngeal. Here I am talking about endotracheal. There is no clear evidence for appropriate vacuum pressures and suction catheter size. Um, but what I would say the key thing with children, I've already talked about how they are more vaguely responsive and the detriment suctioning to Karina can have based on their immediate instability, but also when they have bronch these patients the level of erosion at the carina children can sometimes get. Um, so what you want to do is measure the length of their ET tube and the hub on the end of it. Use suction catheters that have got radiated markings on it and never suction to more than half a centimetre below the length of the ET tube. Um, Morrow and Argent did a, a comprehensive review in 2008 and whilst they said that there aren't um, in patient studies, this is their recommendations with regards to um, suction catheter size uh, when you're looking at patients on a PICU, which there is no better guidance out there. So this is a, a fairly good benchmark to go for. So the million dollar question, does physio on PICU for patients with bronchiolitis work? As part of a service improvement project, we collected some data for patients that were treated in 2018-19 at Evelina. And we looked at them before and after and a bit later on from them having physio treatment. And there was no significant difference in their resistance, their oxygen saturation index, their respiratory rate or their end tidal. So, Certainly it isn't looking like there is an immediate difference before and after, but we have to take into account this was a single centre study. It's retrospective and a lot of the treatments these patients received were lavages, which we've already discussed may or may not be appropriate in this population and certainly shouldn't be a blanket treatment. And then we had a look at comparing the patients during the time periods they were having physio versus the patients when they were just receiving standard nursing care. And then we do find that the groups are different. So the oxygen saturation index is higher for those patients going through a period where they're having physiotherapy. So maybe there's a difference in population we're seeing. And it does look like the end tidal CO2 seems to be higher for those patients that are receiving physiotherapy. I don't think this necessarily tells us much about those patients and their response to physio, but it probably shows that we are targeting those patients that are more unwell with those physiotherapy treatments. So, you know, the populations are different and probably appropriately so. But as things currently stand in the literature, does physio and PIC for bronchiolitis work? doesn't look like there's any clear evidence. So once again, we're going back to that no blanket treatment, no treating just in case. You need to assess. And if you find a focal problem, use the intervention that is most likely to benefit the resolution of that focal problem. Thank you, Ellie. That's brilliant. Really kind of some really valid points to take away there from that part of the session. Um, that's all for us today. I hope you guys have found this kind of informative um, and just kind of uh, expand your knowledge and understanding of uh, the physiotherapy perspective in bronchiolitis. What we'll do is uh, on the next slide, we'll just leave our contact details. Should you have any questions about uh, the webinar that we filmed today, um, please feel free to get in touch uh, with those. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much. Um, take care and we'll see you soon.